So I'm going to call to order the Planning Commission meeting for January 23rd. First, we have to approve the agenda. So the Planning Commission is ready. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Okay. Those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Okay. okay, any opposed? Agenda approved. Uh, comments from the chair. A um, couple of quick things. Um, I, I want to remind everyone that we only, have, we only have four people. We don't have everyone here tonight, but I want to remind everyone that in-person meetings are available if you want to go to City Hall and sit with Mike. And um, sometime in the near future, we should probably talk about how everyone feels about that. Um, but we'll wait for like the for the full group uh, or at least close to the full group before we have that discussion. But I do want, did want to make everyone aware that um, there's at least the option there that anytime you want, you do not have to do this by Zoom. Um, you can go in and join Mike and uh, participate there. And maybe um, more of us will do that in the near future. And also it's kind of up in the air long-term about whether the state is going to want or let us do this anyway. Um, the, you know, this being using Zoom for everything. Um, okay, that's one thing. The other thing is I also wanted to give everyone a heads up that um, as we start to um, work on this Congress for New Urbanism report, and we start to, um, and, and other things that come up for, for potential changes to send to city council, that um, I'm hoping to delegate some of the like work that's gonna be involved with that. There's gonna be outreach work. There's probably gonna be some other um, things like uh, maybe a letter to the city council at some point explaining our um, points of views or the policy reasons for why we would like to do things. Um, so as that happens, I, I'd like for um, us to spread out the work a little bit because there's going to be a lot of it if we want to do this well. Um, so just a couple of things coming up for us to, to talk about further in the future. Um, that's all I've got. Does anybody else have any um, updates of any kind or anything they want to throw out there? OK. I see that Maria just joined, so I will repeat the um, point that I made a second ago about, because since since Maria just joined, I want her to be aware of the fact that um, it is possible to go into City Hall and join Mike and go to, in, like if you if you prefer an in-person format over Zoom, then that, that we all have that option. So I just wanna make sure everyone's aware of that. And that we'll probably talk about it in the near future, whether, um, like what the group would like to do as far as in-person or, or remote um, participation in the meetings. But yeah, it's, it's available for people to do right now. And, and that's all I've got um, as far as comments. Um, the next thing on the agenda, unless anybody else has anything to share or comments, is uh, comments from the public. I'm not seeing any members of the public the moment. So we're going to breeze through that and uh, get into the city plan web page. Uh, so this is just a check in to see where a couple of things are the landing site and the review um, or review of the energy page and where those things are. Um, and I take it, Julia, you are here to do that for us. So I will hand it off to you. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, Aiden wishes she could be here, but fortunately she has COVID, so uh, it'll just be me this evening. Um, and she did fill me in on the discussion from last time um, about the landing page. And uh, essentially today I'd like to review with you um, potential copy for the landing page, both the first page, homepage um, that you might see logging on and also um, the about the plan page. Um, right now, this is in a Word document form. Um, and if this uh, text looks good generally um, to you, then we can look at uh, 
adapting it to the website and um, and cleaning it up that way. Uh, but first, I'll just share my screen and um, remind um, us all what the um, the hub site format looks like. If I can find it, my uh, oh, I see the Zoom screen was just blocking it a little bit for me. Okay, I'll try that again. Great. Um, let me know if you can't see my screen, uh, but this is just uh, the hub site and um, how it appears when you first click on it. And right now this has not changed from uh, our last meeting, but this is a reminder of where we are. We have um, just some simple text about what this website is. Um, and then scrolling down, there are the icons for each of the chapters. Um, and then right now, the implementation information has a little home right here. Um, so this is a, just keep this in your mind of uh, how it currently uh, is set up. And then we can compare that um, to the Word document. And um, if there are no questions right now about uh, the way this is formatted right now on the website, I can uh, start sharing the um, text, draft text. Uh, uh, go for it. Great. OK. Um, so essentially, I combined um, some materials that Kirby had prepared um, that I think you reviewed last time and um, some materials that Mike had prepared. And I think both of these um, sets of texts were really useful um, and helpful uh, context for the plan. Um, and they accomplished different things. Kirby's statement um, was more inspirational, talking about the city's values. Um, and Mike's um, statement was more practical and explained the format of the plan and um, was would certainly be useful to somebody um, who's just looking to uh, try to understand the contents of the plan and, and how it'll be used in the future. Um, and then some additional notes about goals for this landing page. Uh, definitely the, the about the plan page should explain why Montpelier chose to take this approach and have a digital city plan, um, a bit about the process, and of course, explaining the organization um, of the plan, particularly the implementation um, segments. So what I've come up with is um, text for the landing page, which is here, and then um, text for the plan description page about this plan tab, which is you know a separate tab on the website uh, just below it. So first we can go through the landing page. Um, and I think Mike may have sent this over uh, just a few minutes ago, but of course that might not have been time to, to read this through fully. Um, I won't read this through fully out loud right now, but I will just go through the headings and, and describe the, the purpose of this text. Um, so the idea uh, of the text of this, the draft text here is to have a first, you know, inspirational statement or just um, topic sentence, if you will, uh, for each section. Um, and that can be broken up um, with pictures or those icons um, and other media that we describe here um, to still make sure that this isn't just a block of text on, on the landing page. Um, there's a, a need to describe what's on the website and be thorough in that, uh, but also make sure that um, we're not overwhelming visitors to the site with text um, and making sure that this is concise. So hopefully that this uh, this draft text threads that needle, but let me know if if um, if there's room for improvement there. So starting off at the top, Montpelier has a bright future. Um, open to suggestions on that statement, but um, I just wanted to start with something positive here um, that could is very easy for folks to understand. 
um, and uh, sets the tone immediately as a as a positive um, positive tone and um, forward looking. And then this paragraph goes on to explain um, that this city plan um, is addressing multiple aspects of the city: values, strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and the most pressing issues facing the city, the housing crisis, climate change, and social inequities. Um, these are pretty broad terms, but for an opening paragraph, I think, um, you know, they, they're all encompassing, um, but also get at some of the um, specific topics that are going to be addressed in the, in the chapters. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the sentence describes that the plan is um, a roadmap. Um, it sets a vision for a more equitable and sustainable Montpelier and provides a roadmap to achieve that vision. Um, let's just stop there. Any, <laughs> excuse me, any questions? <clears throat> Anybody have any questions? I do. Maria? Um, could we scroll back down to Kirby's language from last week? I felt like it was a lot more engaging. <laughs> Um, like to pull someone in who just kind of, you know, just Googled Montpelier city plan. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't, I kind of like the way that Kirby had written it. Um, it seemed less formal and just something that would engage a reader. And I think the information that you drafted after could come after, you know, get into like more specifics, but I, I liked Kirby's language. Um, that's great. So. Thanks for that feedback. And then going back up to what you just showed us. Um, yep, here. Yeah, so I feel like if we have something that, you know, like, a short first paragraph that kind of just like lays it out there like Kirby did and then kind of go into like the you know city plan addresses Montpelier's most pressing issues and then um you know I think you kind of added the correction <laughs> when you read it out loud you said like the plan is a roadmap oh the plan presents a clear vision and I actually liked your use of the plan is a roadmap for explaining to people what this is and why we are doing it. Um, so I kind of, so that the last sentence of that paragraph, I think if you could flip it around to say like the plan is a roadmap to achieve mm -hmm. our vision for a more equitable and sustainable Montpelier. I feel like it's just like a very clear cut explanation of why this plan exists and what it's supposed to do. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Maria. I agree with that, um, with everything that you said. Uh, does anybody else have feedback for right now for the draft landing language? OK. Um, go for it, Julia. OK, so moving on, um, there's Definitely, a, I, we've heard a desire from this group to have um, some infographic materials on uh, the landing page and show um, some of the uh, data, most relevant data that um, will help kind of draw people in and um, help people learn something that they might uh, not already know about um, the state of different issues in Montpelier. Um, and also set the stage for how this plan will measure progress on those issues. So um, this next section, the topic sentence is Montpelier has made progress on key goals, but there is still work to be done. And then um, there's a short description there. Um, but the main section, main uh, purpose of this section is to show this infographic. Um, and one possible layout is to have a column on the left titled the problem and a column on the right titled 
progress to date. And under the problem, there would be a statistic um, illustrating how Montpelier is experiencing a particular issue. So the number of experience, individuals experiencing homelessness or um, statistics related to uh, greenhouse gas emissions or um, the pandemic um, effects on the local economy. Um, and then opposite each of those uh, statistics um, would be an accompanying statistic about prog progress to date on that topic. Um, so as an example here for housing, on the left-hand column, there's a certain number of individuals in Montpelier experiencing homelessness. Um, and then on the right-hand column, um, some statistic about uh, the number of housing units that have been constructed um, in a recent time period. So um, these, the exact statistics here are certainly, um, can certainly take different forms. And these are just ideas. I don't obviously have these statistics at the moment, um, but this could be um, a succinct way to uh, show people some of the type, some of the issues that this plan addresses. Um, and then also um, get people thinking about some of the, the progress um, that's possible coming out of this. So any so, comments on that? Yeah. Um, so I, I would really like to get the planning commissioners to give some feedback right now for SC about the infographic question. My, um, my, my memory tells me that in the past, um, there's been infographics suggested for this page and we've been open to that and, and fine. I don't know that we're just to be clear, thinking that that you know, that's a huge important goal for us. If it's appropriate to have infographics, that it's it's nice to have those images that catch that capture people's attention. Um, but I just want to be clear that like, I don't know, I think it's like aesthetics driven question and, and it just kind of depends. That said, what planning commissioners, what do you think that if we are going to display something on the landing page, like a bit of information using an infographic, what are the key things from our city plan? What are the key issues we think that that, that exist for the city that that that, that should be? Um, I've got to say that I'm I'm not I don't think we need a pro a problem and a progress to date type thing. And I actually am a little bit scared of a progress to date type thing because I don't trust that we are going to be super diligent and updating this all the time. So oh, I, I could, that wasn't the um yeah, I, I that's not the intent here. But um, yeah, um, what well, so so like a progress to date thing that's like statistics from like six years ago is like, I don't know, kind of it kind of begs the question of like why haven't they updated this? But um, so so anyways, the infographics probably should say the date on them. I mean, just with that thought in mind. Um, so like in two thousand twenty three, uh, you know, we had a, a, you know statistic blah blah. Um, so, so I just want to ask the planning commissioners, like, what are the big things? I think housing is something that's come up a lot and things about housing um, that we see, like, for instance, I think one thing that came up last week, which is a huge issue in Vermont and probably what's well, really a big issue specifically for Vermont, I, I actually, I'm going to stop short of saying nationally, and that's over housing. That is huge house with one or two people in it. Um, do we want an infographic that talks about that. I think Mike mentioned that he, he does have some data about that. Um, is that something that we would like to see on the landing page? What are people's thoughts? Kirby, um, my thoughts are, if this is on the landing page, I think it should be a simple one that people can understand. Um, just like how many, um, how many housing units have we have we added? And I do think that we can set it up to um, to just auto refresh. I did um, contact Mike about the permit software they use and um, emailed the um, developers of it, who I don't think 
gotten back to me as to whether or not they have sort of an API that we can just use so that Mike and his staff don't have to do anything different than they already do. Um, that said, if they, if for whatever reason they can't, or there is no way for me to hook into it, you can set it up so that it, it could be extremely simple and easy for, um, for Mike or anyone to just, you know, punch in either the number of, of permits or COs. We could also just grab the um, census building permits, assuming the city is reporting, already reporting to the census. Um, housing starts there. I could set that up to, to pull that up automatically and that would be pulling from the same source. So I, I don't okay. know, that, that, that's yeah. my thought. And and like, if we have, even if, it, if it's just one and if it's simple um, that, and people can understand it, I think that, that would be, be helpful. I think, I think that that's fine with what I'm understanding is um, like a, something that's just like a graphic that says how many housing units were, were, were created in that year and the current year and setting it up in a way in which we can be certain that it will be updated every year. Is that, is that what you're saying? Or every, every month even. Um... So yes, yeah, that's, I guess that's what I'm saying. We could also put, um, include the um, census population estimates if we wanted. They aren't always necessarily the most accurate, but um, yeah, I guess we could include those pretty, pretty easily without, um, without too much work. Okay. Yeah. If you guys can make that happen, that would be, that would be good with me. Um, so what do the other planning commissioners think of that idea? And also, do you have other um, infographic type ideas that would work for the landing page? I just want to weigh in on the housing starts. Um, <clears throat> I think if I was given how you know how many houses were built or how many units were built in 2020 i would have no idea how to gauge if that was a lot or a little is there data of, like historical data of how many houses were built over time and i think that might be a more helpful infographic you know to i have no idea what that curve would look like but if it looks like a lot of housing used to be built and now it has stopped i think that would be a more Mm -hmm. it's, you know informational or, or like a percent growth which is kind of what you're like like would the, you think that would be helpful if it's like ex Montpelier had 0 0.5 percent growth in housing this year right or even over the course of the last five years like I don't know you know what period you'd have to look at for that to because I mean <laughs> as someone who's lived here for the past year I don't have there been any housing has there been any housing built? There has. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's been some. Yeah, <laughs> it's somewhere. Um, it's somewhere. There's been some, and and I think you make a good point about the total number of units because we're actually a pretty small town. So, yeah. for like a hundred units, was that would actually probably be considered quite a bit for us. But mm -hmm. I think maybe some people coming from bigger places would see a hundred units and think like, oh my god, there's oh, you're yeah. not doing anything. So, um, mm -hmm. so that's why, yeah, like a percent growth or or just the raw number compared with total units or something what do you yeah, think I, what do you think between those two things what do you guys think i think the total total number over you know the trend over time helps can help tell the story of how, how we're doing and um i don't know we could chat with mike about either the reliability or um mm. how far how far back we have data that we're com comfortable with. Otherwise, there are other, other proxies we can use and then have the more recent years filled in. OK, I think that's that's a great idea. And I think that's um, you know something for Julia to, to look into as a, as a specific area. Do we have any other um, areas that we think we want to call out 
for a landing page infographic that we think is, you know, a crucial part of the story that's landing page worthy, I guess. Um, I, I, I'm not good with sort of <laughs> infographics or what metrics we'd use, but I, I still keep coming around to sort of, I think really the three core issues that we should be highlighting, not only on the landing page, but just as sort of the thread that binds the city plan is housing, economic slash business development, and third, sort of transportation as a proxy for sort of infrastructure development and maintenance. Um, and I just, you know, I, I get sort of the proposals that are here for the infographics, but, I, you know, I just feel like, like homelessness, global warming and pandemic, it's, just, it's, you know, while they are important things, A, I think it's kind of heavy duty for a landing page for a city plan, those issues, B, they're just a little bit amorphous. I think if we can kind of collapse down to like really core, those three core issues that I think really, I think we hear uh, from, you know, residents here time and time again about economic development, housing. And I think, you know, I, I again, I use transportation, but I think it's kind of, a, I, I don't know how we get to sort of the issue of like, we're paving the roads, <laughs> you know, like, we're, you know, we're doing those things that we're, we're, we're making sure the water system is functional because I think, especially recently, there's some concerns about infrastructure. I, I, I throw that up being, I want to be very clear, like, I don't know what metrics we can plug in and use as an infographic stat to point those things out, but that's just my suggestion. Yeah, I think that that's helpful. And, you know, I, I wouldn't oppose housing, transportation, and economic development as being three things that are brought out. Um, I know in our economic development chapter discussions, um, we did kind of uh, pinpoint some areas that we thought were important. Um, and John, if you could help me remember, because I, I remember you being part of those discussions. I mean, does, does this particular stat come to mind for you as an important part of economic development for us? Sorry, what's what's that? Um, I was asking you, like, if you recall from our discussions about economic development, we had kind of narrowed down things we thought were going to be important. I almost need to just pull up maybe those, the plan and refresh my memory. I was just well, like, wondering, is, is there an important economic development stat based on our discussions? It's at the edge of my memory. Yeah, I think we were, well, we were focused on jobs and to, to the extent that it's reported, we can get numbers on jobs that are, you know, over um, and um, over X dollars in terms of what that equates to for a monthly wage or we were talking about like the quality of jobs so that we just didn't want to measure an increase in low paying jobs as, as you know, success, but um. But yeah, sometimes simple is still good and nothing, very few things tell an entire picture in, their, in and of themselves. So if we wanted to just um, measure jobs, we could do that as well. Yeah, I think jobs, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look real quick to see if I can remember specifically about jobs, what we were talking about. And then, and then Let's just going with Aaron's suggestion about the, those three pillars. What's the transportation area that we think would be an important thing to draw out on the landing page? Yeah, that, that's the one, frankly, where I really draw a blank. I don't know how we can sort of convey. Well, I think, that. I mean, we talk, I, I mean, where I would start thinking is we, we've talked a lot in the plan and just in the planning commission in general about walkability about not having a vehicle centric city. Um, so like a statistic about sidewalks or walkability or. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be, you know, it could be just sort of, uh, again, I, I don't know how to convey this information, but you know, the development of the bike trail, the, you know, um, sort of, the amount of paving that's in, you know, 
paving repaving that's occurred in the last few years you know it's it's i think it's a bit of a double edged sword because i feel like if we may be drawing attention rather to the problem as opposed to drawing attention to the work that we've done to solve it by having it on the landing page but i don't know i'm i'm just spitballing here i was thinking that the i mean i'm kind of thinking of it as like what what chapters lend themselves to having stats and are more tangible like I, I think that was what aaron was saying some of them aren't um certainly those like housing and economic development certainly do transportation uh, you know struggling a bit but maybe it's historical resources of more of an aesthetic issue than the other two which are pretty you know kind of substantive not to say historical resources is not important but there are good stats on that you know we have the largest historical district there's 500 and something properties um i guess i don't know what the infographic would i guess it would just be about the importance of protecting this historic nature of montpelier i think that's something top of mind for a lot of people in montpelier too yeah that's a that's a um that's a good question about is it is that something we want to focus about focus on the landing page um it is certainly something we can brag about. Is that what we want? My thought for the landing page is that we're trying to capture and get people interested. And so it doesn't, if, if we shouldn't try to bend ourselves over backwards. See, I think the infographics will certainly appear within each one of our storyboards. Your 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 audio is your audio is garbled, Mike. Yeah, your audio your audio is still on. Is my audio working? Yeah, yeah, you're fine, Kirby. It's just Mike. Okay. It was good for all those times. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's better. When you lifted it up, I could hear you. Something like this is better. Yeah, that's a lot better. It's not perfect. So I'll try not to move. And, <laughs> uh, so I was just, I was just saying, you know, maybe we don't need to. Um, you know, the, the point of the landing page is to try to get people interested, and then um, kind of give them a, a quick bite of like something. Um, mm. to get them interested in looking farther. And so maybe that's a infographic, maybe it's not. The three big things are housing, sustainable infrastructure, and economic development. Certainly, the housing is probably the number one topic. If uh, sustainable infrastructure, certainly from the council standpoint, would be uh, you know, a close second, and then whether it's economic development or the environmental quality or something I don't know would be the third but you, you can figure that out but then whether it's maybe it's just a, a quick sentence maybe it's a maybe it's an infographic you know let, let's try to make someone feed on goal which is to get people to mix not to click on and start reading their story okay uh, I think I think I can um, <laughs> jump in. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> um, your your audio is better, but uh, but I think I um, if you can hear my audio, <laughs> I'll just paraphrase what you said, um, which is uh, that this uh, infographic on the landing page um, can be short and should just grab people's attention and give them a taste of um of what's in the plan and um that I think that we heard most of what you said Mike but just at the end there um you said that um the there will be other opportunities for infographics in the story maps and I think that's important to keep in mind so um this infographic definitely doesn't has to have to um you know, say all that we want to say about data uh, in this plan on this website. Um, 
and there are certainly opportunities to to have other uh, statistics represented for the topic chapters but identifying the most um, important things uh, top of mind issues to to highlight about the plan so housing um, definitely has should should be there um, is a good role for this um, yeah so Ju Julia I'd like to just uh, just for the sake of moving on and things just like give you some direction which is mm -hmm. to say that what the planning commission would like to tell you is uh, we'd like to see a housing infographic at this point mm -hmm. a place you know there could be placeholders for now because there's there's no reason to spend a bunch of time discussing this any anymore for because the point is taken that we're going to develop infographics for each chapter and we can pull from those later so the, i think the only placeholder you need to to say now is economic development transportation uh possibly um natural resources or energy um and possibly historic preservation are going to be you know what we plan to fill in later there but we don't need to know exactly what it is i think we did flesh out pretty well for you like what we would like for the housing though um so that's that's kind of what what we're asking uh what what we think would be best for this um and then we yeah and then from then up from there we can just move on and we can figure out the placeholders later okay great that's helpful so just to make sure that i understand that so um the housing infographic uh we can move forward with that with having the um, total number of units divided by the trend over time roughly we can figure it out um how exactly that uh, statistic will show up and I can reach out to John about that. Um, and then uh, listed below it, just as a placeholder for now, economic development, natural resources, um, historic preservation and transportation. And we'll figure out the exact statistics to yeah. be used there later. And we don't necessarily intend for all of those. Okay, but those are possibilities. You know, yeah, those are possibilities. And I think what makes sense for you know the aesthetic here um, and for the storytelling aspect it's like we right. don't have a set number in mind um okay, okay. Yeah, is a then... magic number so i think three is mm -hmm. good um for um for presenting these these statistics and it shows um you know three different topics can show the breadth of the plan so that would be my suggestion um but we can look at it uh down the line yeah um yeah, so, so so go ahead, Julie, with the rest of it, if there was more you wanted to show us. Great. Okay, so moving on, um, this, is, this next uh, block of text here uh, is more involved with the, uh, the purpose of the plan. So the topic sentence here is the Montpelier City Plan identifies central initiatives for the city. Um, and then this is short enough that I'll just read it. The plan asks and answers three main questions. One, what should Montpelier's future look like? The plan identifies a common vision for Montpelier, a set of shared values and priorities that are characteristic to the Montpelier community. Two, how far are we from achieving our vision? Each plan chapter assesses existing conditions for a given topic. The chapters provide an overview of priorities, progress to date, important partnerships, and more. Three, what must happen to make our vision a reality? Each plan chapter provides a set of policy recommendations called aspirations, goals, and strategies that are intended to guide and direct city initiatives. And then there are uh, just a list of uh, links, places to learn more about some of the things that are referenced in this section at the bottom. Any comments on this section, suggestions? People feel okay about this as being uh, part of the landing page. Yeah, I think I think I'll really benefit from actually seeing it like laid out. I think that's going to inform like, do we have too much text or you know, do, what do we need to edit and move around? I think that's going to be, I don't know, for mm -hmm. me anyway. See it, see it laid out. Mike, does this match? You can just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down considering your audio situation. Does this roughly match what you had in mind? Well, I actually plugged in a speaker. Is it working or a microphone? That's great. Okay. 
I had, a spare, I had a spare one, so it works. Um, I wasn't 100% following because I was getting this set up, but yeah, I think that this lays out pretty good. We can, Julie and I can probably work on this over the next couple of weeks to, to get something, you know, Brian, as Brian says, it, we kind of need to see it on the page to see how it looks. Okay. Great. So was there more Julia you want to show us? Sure. So um, this, all that we've reviewed thus far is um, for the landing page, the, um, the very first home page that someone would see when they click on the site. There will be a second tab that people can click on for to learn about the plan. So about this plan. And this is the section that explains um, the format of the document and the website, and also the aspirations, goals, and strategies. So uh, this paragraph, opening paragraph, describes that the city plan um, is no longer a paper document. And it's summarized on the website through the um, story maps. Uh, it lists the 12 topic chapters, and there will be links to each of them. This next paragraph, I'd like to fill in, um, and I can coordinate with Mike to do this, uh, to learn more about uh, the engagement process and be able to summarize uh, that in this paragraph. Then the final paragraph here explains the aspirations, goals, and strategies. Um, this is directly taken and you know, formatted from um, Kirby's and Mike's notes. And um, I provide an example of an aspiration, goal, and strategy for the historic resources chapter. Um, this is just the first one that I pulled, but I'm happy to use another one that might be more representative. Um, but it explains, um, I think it's it's just best to show an example here um, because uh, these can seem, these three categories can seem very abstract, but looking at it as a whole, it's it's pretty clear how they um, all fit together. So. I think I think if, you, if leaving an example there, uh, maybe it would be helpful to put it into its own little gray box or like a sure a box or something just to just to show that it's like 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 a quote box type thing just to show mm -hmm. that it's this is not actual content. This is an example. Yep. Um. Okay. Anybody have any? Feedback for that part? Okay. Um, so is it this is it for the this yes, is it for this, the about page? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it's looking good. I think it's what we had in mind. Great. Um mm -hmm. yeah, I do just want to um say one thing about the infographics, not to dwell on that, but just one note about it. Um, I think the direction that we're ending up at um, makes sense to show the progress over time. Um, and if live updating of the graphics is important, then we can certainly um, work to incorporate that. But um, I think it's it's also important for for the plan to show where where we are. And this may be more important for the infographics that we show in individual plan chapters. Um, but it can be useful for the the statistics used to um, indicate where we are at, as this plan is is being developed. I totally understand the desire to have um, this web plan be a living document, um, but also those statistics that describe the current moment, can be really useful um, in um, providing context for the policy recommendations. Um, so that's just a, some food for thought as we um, 
look towards the statistics um, in the future. So now I'd like to share the energy chapter, which looks, um, sorry, the, okay. Um, this looks pretty similar uh, to the previous version that we showed, but I'll point out a couple key differences. Um, we're now incorporating uh, more narrative right up front uh, to try to draw folks in. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this opening section. And maybe uh, this time I'll, I'll just pause and give folks a chance to, to read this language. Um, and I'm curious whether this uh, you uh, think this is an engaging start to this chapter um, or if it uh, if there are any other things that should be included in this opening section. So my, my initial um, question for you is, um, are you are you getting some of the content from the chapter language that we provided? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. my default is to adapt chapter language. Great, great. That's good enough. Does anybody have any feedback for this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's good. I mean, I think it sets out, you know, the scope of the issue, contextualizes it. And I'm sure, you know, I, at the end of the day, you know, I think Brian's right. I think this is all going to be, it'll all be much clearer and we can start kind of really getting down to brass tacks once we get sort of the complete set in front of us so we can really go through it. I mean, there's no use in sort of wordsmithing stuff right now, but no, I think generally speaking, it's it's good. So. Great. Okay. Um, so Julia, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but um, going back to the like the chapter language, um, which is you know something that we had worked on and voted out for each chapter. Um, like how how much uh, like roughly how much is SE using th those materials like how, like should we expect like a lot of the same content or or do you see it being changed a lot just so that we can set our expectations? Yeah, I think it um, it does depend on the chapter. Uh, certainly, some chapters are much longer, um, and so. Uh, for those longer chapters, I, I find myself condensing a lot, um, and shorter chapters can be contained in full on a story map. Um, so that's one thing uh, to point out. Um, I do capture um, at least something from every section um, of the of the um, plan chapter as it's written. Um, there's there's several pieces of narrative in those plan chapters. The um, for example, the um, overlaps between different um, areas of the plan. Um, that's longer for some chapters than others. Um, I do attempt to capture, um, you know, every every overlap, uh, every other, you know, plan chapter that's mentioned there. Um, but certainly the language is condensed. So, um, there are some sentences in here that are word for word, and then there are, you know, some um, sentences that are are really summarizing um, the the plan chapters. So, I wish I had a, a neater answer to that question, but generally, I, I'm trying to preserve um, the meaning as much as possible. Um, but a lot of times, that does involve um, condensing this and summarizing it for the purposes of the story map. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. And it's looking it's looking good. Uh, Mike, did you have any um, thing to say about this? Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you for the update. Um, 
We appreciate it. Hopefully what you're hearing from us is cogent enough to let you know what we'd like. Um, we mentioned the infographics before. The, the, there was other feedback before about the intro language for the landing page. And it sounded like at least some of us prefer the the attention grabbing stuff of the like draft that I, I'd given you. So I think we would prefer that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but I think that's that's about it. Does, does anybody else have anything for Julia as far as feedback um, or anything for us to be thinking about? Okay. So last call for that. Um, so we're going to have right. about three weeks before the next our next planning commission meeting. So Julia and I are going to be working quite a bit over the next three weeks to start because we're trying to get a template. We're trying to really refine that template so we can then build out the rest of the chapters quickly. Because once you have a template, it's easier to plug and play. So that's what we'll be working on is over the next couple of weeks is to start to build some of these out now that we've got a better sense of the template. That's great. And and also, um, and I think I am speaking for, and please planning commissioners, if you disagree with this, speak up. But um, I think that, you know, we're okay with waiting a little while before looking at this again, like, it, like, because I, I keep hearing over and over from people like, well, it'll be nice to see once we actually see like a, you know, a prototype, like, a, you know, fully fleshed out. So once, you know, we're, I think we're okay waiting until we have a bunch of chapters developed and the landing page is, is, is um, caught up to, to what we've been envisioning. Um, so, so we can wait for a while is what I'm saying, I think, to, to review again. And when we do, hopefully there'll be a lot to look at. So um, I think that's our feeling about it. Um, that sounds good. Well, good luck and thank you so much. Thank you, Mike, for working so hard with them too. All and right. well, send our regards to Aiden to, yes. to get better. Thanks. Will do. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Um, okay. We're gonna move on. Um so, so the next thing on the agenda is to review the public safety implementation strategy. So hopefully everyone. Um, got to take a look at those. Um, I guess I'll hand it over to you, Mike, for uh, for you to 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 go through what's there and let us know, um, you know, what you're thinking about that. All right. So while I'm bringing this up on my computer. All right, so I will share my screen. So we have a uh, public safety plan. So it's one of our big plans, one of our ones that kind of grabs a whole bunch of information. And so um, one of the last pieces that I've left um, Carol is working on it right now with her board is the restorative justice. So this piece is still being worked on. There's actually more information. She's got a separate document that she's been filling these pieces in on. So we can kind of skip through this one. But restorative justice is one of the pieces of public safety. Um, and then really quick, it's police, fire, EMS, uh, emergency management, dispatch, I think that's all of them. Um, but if you go through, you'll see, and um, most of you are used to seeing all of these in um, in the Excel format. And I haven't done the cut and paste. So at um, at a certain point going forward, I've been trying to finish up community services. Um, and so that's the one I'm working on right now. But at a certain point, I will take this one out of this format and put it into the Excel table so you guys can have it in that format. Um, but I guess I can, I don't know if you want me to just, I can run through a real quick summary of what um, each one had and then take some questions. 
Um, the police aspiration is built around 21st century policing. So, um, and this has been a foundation of the police department for a number of years. Um, there are six pillars. So each one of their goals became, each one of the pillars became a goal. So they have six goals to go with the six pillars. And a number of, we went through and listed out all of their programs and things and then collapsed them into initiatives. So there's like a community outreach initiative. And a number of these, if you're new to reviewing them, you will see things such as um, the community outreach initiative will show up multiple times. And each one of these strategies is designed to implement that goal that's up here. This one happens to be building trust and legitimacy within the community, Montpelier community. Um, so that's what these are about. Um, whether it's technology, whether it's outreach, whether it's bike and foot, um, whether it's the school outreach officer. And this repeats all the way through um, for the public safety, for the policing, basically. Um, for each one of the six goals. Dispatch. Um, really, I'm trying to remember how many goals they had. Um, but a lot of theirs is, comes down to um, having certified staff. It's good staff, good facilities, and um, a reliable system. So they, I think, had three goals, expand the police station and improve the reliability of the dispatching center. Um, and so, again, these were collapsed into um, – an we used to have a lot of strategies, and we try to collapse strategies that are similar into – um, different things like the Televate upgrade project is probably five or six different projects in one. Uh, I kept fire and EMS together mostly because the fire and EMS are the same people in the same department. So even though really it's two separate jobs, putting out fires and doing ambulance, we kept them we kept them the same. Every everyone who's a firefighter um, is getting trained for EMS and and vice versa. So I think that was straightforward. Emergency management was really big, and emergency management is really big because it has a lot of there's a lot of things that we do um, to be proactive on emergency management. That includes disaster preparedness and emergency response. So that could be everything from a flood to a terrorist attack on the Capitol. So it's it's a wide range of stuff. So there's a lot of um, continuity of operations, um, getting the public ready, and all the different projects that are involved in there. Again, we've done a lot to try to combine them but you can read through and just roll through and just see there's a lot of programs that we work on that are emergency management related. And I think that's actually it, just those, but there's a lot in the emergency management. So I will get those transferred over, but that is in a really quick nutshell, that's what has been discussed other than restorative justice, which as I said, we're working on. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so, so just, yes, assuming people have had a chance to, you know, review this, uh, in more detail, are there any questions, comments, suggestions, uh, for anything in this chapter? I was going to ask, is the, is the CAN network still, um, uh, I'm, I'm new to town too, I knew the city too, so I didn't know if that's something that's still around or not. I, I heard it lost funding or is it, I don't know if it still lives. It's kind of, it's in many ways from the city standpoint, city government standpoint, it doesn't really exist anymore. It was originally created. The capital area neighborhoods was created in about 2008 for developing the previous plan. And that was how they kind of did the, the master plan that we have today. What's called the master plan that we have today was developed by the developing neighborhood groups and, and writing the chapters based on what the public thought we should be doing. Um, we've taken a different approach, but 
can neighborhoods kept going in some ways? Those ones that were formed kind of tumbled along, kind of self kept themselves going for a little while. And then about two years ago, um, really spurred on by COVID, uh, there was an interest in trying to make sure we got more public outreach and started working with the neighborhoods. And so uh, a group stepped up, the Sustainable Montpelier group stepped up and said they would be willing to host and take care of doing the outreach on everything if we gave them money. And so the council did vote to put in, I think, $40,000 or $20,000 Twenty thousand for six months, or forty thousand for a year, or something like that, to help fund, um, pay sustainable Montpelier to do the organization on those. Um, and then, coming up to this, maybe this December, they said at the end of December, sustainable Montpelier said they weren't going to keep doing that, um, and they were going to focus on other things. So, there's really no funding and no organization to go with it, and so it's. In effect, there may be some can neighborhood groups that are still organized, but they're not working directly with the city. We've tried to reach out to set things up, but there has been, it's been, I haven't been directly the person working on it, but I know there's, there was some interest in trying to keep it going, but it didn't seem to be working. So we've just decided to not, not to do it within the city, but there may be some individual neighborhoods that are still staying organized for other reasons. Okay. Anyone else have something? I have a question about the restorative justice section. Mm -hmm. What agency <clears throat> are those programs under? We actually have a community justice center and we have a director who does community justice. Um, in a lot of other places, they're either done regionally or they're done by a separate group. Um, I want to think I live in Hardwick. I know we have Community Justice Center in Hardwick, but it's not part of city government. It's a kind of a separate organization. Here in Montpelier, we have pulled community justice into. So everybody who is in the community justice, um, who works for the community justice center works for the city. Um, so we're a little bit different in that. And that helps us get a much closer relationship between the police department and the CJC. Okay. Um, my other question was about just the topic heading, the public safety plan. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just a suggestion because public safety is such a huge umbrella of things. You know, it could... Um, back when I worked in transportation, we would, it was safety and security. So we even broke out safety into the two different arms because they're not the same thing. Um, so, but looking at this plan, it involves all of the agencies that work in public safety specifically, as opposed to, you know, transportation or other areas that deal with public safety, but not as their exclusive uh, purpose. So to avoid confusion, could we add something about how this is like a pu public safety agency plan as opposed to just a public safety plan? Because I feel like they're adding in that these are agencies within the government that are providing their plans to kind of just makes the chapter clearer. And maybe it, it will be clearer once it's drafted. Um, Yeah, I mean, it can be whatever the Planning Commission wants. Uh, we've we've talked about it as a public safety. We've talked about it as public safety and justice uh, or public safety and community justice. Um, yeah, it, it is tough because it's emergency management. It's it's a such a wide range. Um, unlike the other big chapter, which is community services, it's pretty clear everything under it is a community service. And, you know, um, and there may be some other community services that are in other chapters, but for the most part, those are the big community services. Um, this one, I agree, and and we can, which whatever the planning commission would like to to have as the title of this one, it could be public safety, it could be justice, it could be public safety agencies. Uh, what do we have thoughts about the suggestion for 
public safety agency or something else. Anybody have any thoughts? Is it, would, uh, you know, what do people generally think about, about making that change? Does it sound like a good idea to say public safety agency plan? I'm gonna throw two cents in on, on one part, part of it. I don't think I like calling, pulling out uh, public safety and in community justice apart from each other because it suggests that that community justice isn't an important part of public safety or, or something you know what i mean i wouldn't want to like make a ref like an inference that that um that minimizes restorative justice um but uh so that, so but first things first i mean what do we think about public safety agency and um and maria you you said you would prefer that right like that you think that would be better yeah, I mean, just because when I got to like, especially at the police section, it was, I was expecting something more focused on public safety, you know, like break-ins, you know, like actual <laughs> concerns that I have as a member of the community, but it was really more about the operations of mm -hmm. police, you know. It's, it's, it's kind of about what the police want. Right. So it's like, like the needs of these public safety agencies rather than mm -hmm. what's actually being done for us, you know. Um, am I, I, I'm making this distinction. I'm not sure if anyone else cares or sees it. I, I see it. I see your point and I like it. I think the only thing that give me pause is, is uh, are people going to be confused about what public safety agency plan means? Um, it's a lot of words. Maybe agencies, plural, public safety agencies plan. And that does kind of more specifically get at what exactly it is. Um, just, just for purposes of like, of, of moving on real quickly, uh, informally, those in favor of changing it to public safety agencies plan, say aye. 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 Can I also have a public safety services plan? You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's kind of splitting the baby a little bit more. So I, th I thought I saw Gabe mouth it <laughs> but i didn't hear from john and Aaron on that one um can you hear me kirby I, yeah i can hear you a little bit it's a little low okay well it looks like i don't know people are lukewarm <laughs> Um, we can we can leave it for now, I think, uh, and um, and think about it. Let's think about it, and if if people um, like the idea, we can we can come back around. Just um, moving on momentarily. Do we have any other questions or feedback about aspects of the plan? I have some things if but I don't I, I was gonna be patient and but if I'm not hearing anything else I'll I have a couple of things. Um just just things that came to mind looking at it. Um for the for the un, both of these are under the, the police section. Um under the CIT, the you know, crisis intervention training section, I was wondering if that could even be explained expanded um so it's yeah it's under training i think yep yeah there we go so the goal there is maintain the current level of training for um Montpelier police Montpelier police department officers and take up additional opportunities for training when they emerge which is 
good. And then, and then, so there's the police officer training program, which is a kind of discrete thing. And then there's crisis intervention team program. Um, and this is continue to train officers in CIT. Um, the goal itself actually suggests that maybe there'll be other trainings to consider, but those, but, but all we're doing is maintaining or continuing what we've got. So I was, that's why I was thinking of expanding maybe the CIT strategy to say, you know, something to the effect of, and consider or research or maybe consider is the best word and, and consider other uh, training opportunities, um, you know, something like that, just to, just to imply that, that where I'm coming from is like more crisis intervention, the better we can get at that, I think the better. It's a, it's a major area for public safety that is just a huge part of what police do when they respond to calls. And I feel like, you know, over time, it's not something that policing in general has, has focused enough on. Which brings me to another thing, which is maybe a bigger question, which is also in this section, Um, the possibility of Montpelier actually using social workers for this stuff, which I know is like a big area, big can of worms to, to possibly get into. But um, I don't know, what do, what do people think about having a strategy here or including in the strategy, you know, consider the possibility of having full-time social workers do this kind of work. Um, I don't know, what are, what are people's reactions to us? Putting it in there and seeing what happens um, at city council. Kirby, what is the, the current status of using social workers? I mean, I don't know any of the um, yeah, so my, understa my, my understanding is what's kind of done now is like the officers get some training in like the CIT type thing, which is not nearly the same thing as like being an actual social worker, right? Um, and then there's this program where they work with Washington County Mental Health for certain um, types of calls for social work type stuff. But this relationship, as I understand it, is sort of, it's, uh, it's sporadic and it's not consistent. Like sometimes Washington County Mental Health will participate and, and help the police, but it's kind of when when Washington County Mental Health has a chance, like when they're available and for calls that they feel comfortable with, it's not a um, foolproof situation. Um, and I'm not even sure the current status of that partnership, but I, I'm assuming this is still use some. So um, that's what I understand is kind of what's done. So. Uh, So yeah, I think having something in the plan about having like a real long-term workable social worker type approach through the police department is very much worthwhile. Um, it's just a matter of, do we feel comfortable as a planning commission talking about these things? Cause I am fully aware of like what I'm talking about right now is like a little bit out going outside our lane a bit um, yeah i think it i think it's uh, i think it's outside our wheelhouse yeah i'm close to that i i was just gonna say I, I feel like i don't know enough about it you know if someone were someone were to ask me like why, why was this included i could not speak like very intelligently about it and i'm so all of that to say i'm happy to go along with whenever the planning commission recommend other commissioners mm -hmm. yeah well yeah thanks guys um yeah i mean i, I have the you know same thing like i don't want to i don't want to be going outside the lane but because it's it's not planning policy per se but uh you know it's a thing um well i'm gonna i'm gonna move on from that just just to just to put that in uh, uh just throwing that one out there um, another question I had about the police section was about staffing, where the term full staffing was used. 
And that had to do, I think, with, um, yeah, it's right below. And I think that this goal is something to do with retention. Uh, if you could scroll up a little bit, Mike, so we can see the goal for this for the context. It's like emotional support and work-life balance to officers, and then there's police staffing level policy. And I thought that the strategy to reach and maintain full staffing to ensure the department has enough officers. Um, that's a subjective phrase in my mind, like what is full staffing? Because like that, that goes to how much police presence we're going to have in the city. And, and the way it's phrased is kind of objectively like, like there's a number that we know, but um, so I don't know. That's that's something that I that I wasn't super comfortable with. I feel like um, if we're going to talk about staffing as it relates to emotional support or work life balance for officers, then um, there's issues like decreasing the number of police that we have on shift or decreasing the workloads, you know, via responses to calls and things like that um like and yeah i don't know i don't i don't i don't need to dwell on that one either but that was another one that stood out to me well kirby what is like the appropriate avenue in which to push back on some of this stuff that's i don't know it's it's tricky for us i mean because um we're supposed to be offering you know planning commissions to take on these things and our you know, policies go to like land use type issues. Um, so it is kind of out of our wheelhouse, but then again, it's also part of the city plan. So um, yeah, I don't know. This is, this is a, it's a weird one. It's a weird chapter because it's, it doesn't Mike, obviously relate. Mike, do you maybe want to just back up for a second and tell us the process by which these goals were gotten to? Because my understanding is we had you know, outside people come in and make some recommendations and there's boards and there's, you know, people have really thought about this who've looked at it for a while before before it's come to us. Can you just talk about that a bit? So for the way I developed this was to work with uh, Brian Pete before he left and Eric, uh, the new chief, um, when he came on board. So the primary approach was to work with them, but they've been working on this. And, you know, as we said, the focus, we could have, we could have focused and we can, you know, arrange this chapter to focus on, on safety itself. And they kind of looked at it from the standpoint of having a good, um, having a good police system is, is, is how we're going to end up getting good results because it's more than just reducing crime. It's also about all of these other objectives that people have for their police departments. And so, um, and one of the pillars, as we said, there we're focusing on 21st century policing, which was uh, an Obama initiative, um, you know, focused on how to rebuild trust with community, how to um, engage with the community. And one of the pillars, you know, using this one as an example is to, um, provide emotional support, work-life balance for officers. And that a lot of that comes down to officers that uh, it's, it's better for the officers and it's better for the community. Um, when you have officers that um, work and work and work and work and work and work and show up and they're tired and that's when accidents happen, that's when mistakes happen, that's when things happen is um, when officers don't have that opportunity to have those that time off and so we do have a, a you know a full full staffing for montpelier's police department is 17 officers that includes the police chief we have a working police chief we don't have an administrative police chief so it's 17 officers is full um and the reason for that is it it allows for a schedule that can be fully built out allowing everybody to work regular shifts and still have time for everybody to have time off to go and take vacations. So there's not going to be 16 officers on at one time. There may only be three or four. Um, 
And what it allows for is people to go to training. Every time somebody goes to training, you need to have somebody come in. So that means somebody coming in on overtime or somebody coming in on um, not being able to go on vacation because somebody else is going on training. When we're fully staffed, people can go to training and we're not calling people in off on their vacations or their days off. It, that's that's why they want the fully staffed is it allows the department to operate and give people their time off, their time to spend with their families, their time to uh, decompress. There's it's a very stressful job. So that's that's why that's why they emphasize the staffing policy so much is they really wanted to make sure that council and the public understands the value of the fully staffed department. It's not just to have more officers, it's not to have more on the street. It's actually not adding any more people on the street. It's just giving people time off. Um, you're going to have the same number of people if you have 14 as you would having 17, except that those 14 don't get vacations and they don't get time off and they're getting called in a lot. So that's um, it's it's that's that's what the 17 officers and that's why the fully staffing and that's why it's so important to them. Uh, and they they like to make sure that that conversation comes up with city council because it's always an easy place to cut when it comes time for budgets. So that's why they're always like um, that. That's why they want to emphasize that the need for that full staffing. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a little bit of the answer to that specific question. But um, a big picture, how this all came together is to working primarily through the police department. There was a review. When Brian Pete came in, the first thing he did was do a full evaluation of everything, of all the departments, of all the things, and wrote a report. Then there was a police review committee that came in, reviewed things, and made some recommendations. That also was incorporated uh, into the into the next plans going forward, including this plan. So we've reviewed a number of pieces to kind of to to build this together as to how to how to move forward on the six pillars. Um, and that's, as I said, that's why it's focused as an aspiration and goals on the six pillars, as opposed to say, having a public safety goal of let's reduce crime or let's do this. It's, um, it's more focused on um, an agency plan. And I think that's a good, good um, analysis uh, as public safety agency plan, because it's getting the agency this is how this is how to operate this one um to get the best results for the community thank you so i mean um i'm i'm comfortable like letting some of these little criticisms go i mean i do want to make a note though that the like to rebut the full staffing thing real quick 17 officers east montpelier has zero police officers so their full staffing is zero. Like the 17 number is still a, a policy judgment of this is how much police force we're going to have. It's not about training. I mean, they could have fewer people at a time on shifts. Um, so they're still like, like and just do less, have less presence. So, so I just want to throw that out there. But I do think it's probably appropriate to leave it to like a, the public review process and maybe that's what we say about this chapter. And it sounds like people would be comfortable with us saying, you know what, we didn't, we're not really going to touch this with a very heavy hand at all, because this is maybe outside our wheelhouse and just let city council know that that's the review process done by the planning commission for this one, aside from changing it to public safety agency plan. Um, do people, are people comfortable with that approach for this one? Are we annexing East Montpelier? That's how you know if like the press is watching these. <laughs> <laughs> Are we annexing? It's, um, I mean, it's certainly it's certainly a policy, us. certainly a policy question. Um, you know, whether we have or need a police department at all is it's a policy in a in a personal uh, community decision. Um, as to what level and what what amount of service you need. I mean, I live in I live in Hardwick. I have a police department, um, but everybody around no, uh, the communities around us, I pay more in taxes in order to have a police department. But a couple miles down the road is Walden or Greensboro or Woodbury, none of which have police departments. Um, 
And so if there's a response, this, they have to wait for the state police. So if there's a shooting at their house, they got to wait for the state police to come in from Middlesex. And that's a, that's a policy decision that communities make. <clears throat> Montpelier has decided to have one and the, the level of service that's been requested has been this. Now we could go to having less service. That's a decision for the public. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm completely aware that I'm like on a bit of a um, soapbox about this. And so letting it, letting that go and letting, letting the public respond to what they think of the plan, I think is, is probably the most appropriate thing without planning commission trying to put his two cents in because it's, it's outside of our, our wheelhouse. But I think that would be the comments we want to pass along to city council on this one. So if everybody's okay with that, we can do that. But before we totally move on from the review of this, um, I'd like to check back in, um, just, uh, just a straw poll vote. Um, if you if you would be in favor of changing the title, um, say uh, yay now. Yay. 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 Yeah. Changing it to what? <laughs> well, probably to public safety agency plan instead of public safety plan. Or, sur if you don't, or services, public safety services. Or public safety services. Make it clear that it's their plan, not necessarily, you know, so like if, if reducing it, crime or something so, more. So my, my question is just like, if is, is there any iteration which you would like to change it? If so, say yay. Um, okay, so those who don't think that, that a change is needed say nay right now. So did we have four yays before? Sounded like we did. Yep, probably. Okay, so okay, I was that was just a straw poll thing. So so to see if it was worth um, a motion. Do we have a motion to change it? And if we and if someone does have a motion, propose what what we would change it to. In your motion. So can I? I don't know the exact terminology here. <laughs> you say I, I I move I move that we change the uh the the title for uh this chapter to okay. I move that we change the title of this chapter to uh public safety services plan. Or what I'm sorry, I let me go back and look at the So, so your your motion is to change it to public safety services plan. Right. Do we have a second to Maria's motion? I second. Okay, so we have a second from Gabe. So now we can have a discussion. Would anyone like to discuss this further before we move to a vote? Yeah, I I never would have picked that up until Maria brought it up, but it's mm -hmm. it's right, you know, like it, we're not talking about our end state, what we want to see Montpelier in terms of our safety, right? This is really the executives of these departments and the things that they feel that they need to provide the services. So I, I think it's a, you know, how important is it? I don't know, but I think it's a, it is a useful distinction. Okay. Anyone else have anything to discuss about it? Okay. Gonna move on to the vote. Those in favor of Maria's motion, say aye. 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 Okay. Those uh, not in favor, say nay. Okay. And any abstentions? Me. Okay. So Aaron abstains. So that was a 401 vote to change the um, title of the chapter okay and i and based on our discussion i don't think we have any more changes that we want to make um and so we're 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 good for now mike and uh you know assuming you're going to put it into the excel spreadsheet and all that but that's i mean since we i don't know we don't even really need to see that uh, that's just going to be for purposes for the uh to put to put on the website Okay.
do you, Mike, do you want us to go back and look at this again when, when restorative justice is done? Probably don't need to. I mean, I'll let you know when it's done so you guys can look at it if you if you feel like it, we can bring it up. I mean, all these chapters, everything we approve is going to end up on the website and we're going to end up looking at it a second time, so. But I can let you know. Okay. Okay, that's, um, I'm comfortable with that. Is everybody comfortable with that? Just, we, we know that we didn't review everything at this point because restorative justice wasn't done but the restore the, the the community justice center will be developing that more fully in the near future okay well if we don't have anything else for this i'm going to move on on our agenda we only have 30 minutes left but we do have the cnu arp recommendations issue next um we had left this off last week with uh, Gabe having the suggestion that we look at the um, uh, design review district boundaries as a possibility to start with for, for if we want to start phasing out zoning caps. It's like, um, Mike, are you able to pull up those district boundaries? Yeah, it'll just give me a yeah. second. Okay, yeah, that might be the best way to go about that. And then we'll take a look at what that boundary is. Um, and, and then Mike can also show us on that map where, you know, the three urban core uh, zoning districts are, or, or neighborhoods, zoning neighborhoods, are all, they, they already don't have a cap and they're gonna be in that design review um, district, I assume. Um, so, so we'll be looking at the other places that could be impacted and then we'll, then the discussion will be about, you know, do we phase out over time? Do we phase out based on geography? It's just a lot of lot of policy possibilities. And Mike, you can tell us your thoughts too. And does anybody need catching up about this discussion? Um, you know, this is this is us taking up that Congress for New Urbanism report from last year about the suggestions. Um, we kind of went through all of those suggestions last week and sort of summarized uh, like where we were on those. And then as far as things that we can take action on, one of the biggest was the suggestion to for Montpelier to get rid of its uh, using density and in its zoning. Okay. So the That's what we're looking at. the dark black line is the design review. So the areas right now, just so everyone kind of gets a little bit of an update, this uh, these dark red areas in here are urban center one. Um, just to orient people, you know, this, this is the downtown. The little hatch lines you see here is the capital complex. So the capital is sitting right where the little hand is. Um, here's the intersection of State and Main, uh, City Hall, uh, Barry, um, Shaw's. Uh, this is Memorial Drive out to the highway. So this area already does not have, this dark red does not have any density requirements. And the same is true for this area of Barry Street. This goes out to about Hubbard Street um, and includes like Sarducci's over on the Stonecutters Way. And then if you start going out Main Street, you get to Urban Center 3 which is out to the roundabout. So all these areas currently do not have any density requirements. It is whatever the number of units you can fit into those areas. So when we have this discussion with CNU about removing density, we already have some places that do it. The conversation we had last, last year, probably a, 
about this time last year was about trying to expand that district just a little bit to go through and say maybe we could get residential 1500 to also not have that requirement and i think i hate to move to go and find the the thing i think this is res 1500 the light green um and the concern um a, a little bit that i had a little bit the, the city council had was the fact that not all of it is in design review so you can see some of it is in design review some of it is not in design review and so they felt what C congress for new urbanism was saying was you need to have robust design regulations if you're going to remove density requirements because you know and and their arguments for and against that um but that was the thought was we could you know um for some of those so the theory or the idea now is rather than tagging it to a density this was the next highest density these have high density 1500 is one unit per 1500 square feet of land which is 27 units an acre so that's a fairly decent density of development um, so that's what the light green, I think, is. Um, and then the other idea would be that if we, you just used the design review district and said, if you're in design review, then we could remove the density. Now, some of these are varying different amounts of um, density. So, you know, that's 1,500. This is 3,000. That's 3,000. There's a little touch of blue up here, which is res 9,000. Um, and this was a little bit of the area that I was talking about last time that I thought th these are some of the areas that might be difficult or or where people are going to make some comments. And I, I think even Brian may have mentioned that that he, he lives out here. This is out um, Terrace Street and um bailey so this is bailey terrace um this is route two on its way heading out so this is mixed use um probably isn't a big deal as big of a deal um that's you know one unit per three thousand right now but this is one unit per six thousand so this is getting a little bit more residential so i think these are the ones that would be the case that people would come up to push back on is this is a residential lower density district, but it's in design review. And the reason it's in design review is because it's all in the historic district. We we matched our design review line in this area to the historic district line. So everything inside is in the historic district. So that's why that line is where it is. So that's uh, that I was just pointing out as a piece of fact, some of these uh, probably won't make a big difference. This is Barry Street. This is a relatively high density area. Um, this is Northfield Street. Uh, you'll probably get some maybe pushback from neighbors surrounding it to go and remove the density from the Econo Lodge property. Um, and then obviously the big massive area of national life but i don't think much is going to happen at national life i don't really think that's an issue if we remove density from national life i don't think it'll have an impact but those are just some of the facts and then i guess i'll i'll open it up to to folks and this is the the college campus up here we can include or not include that that's the vcfa campus Do we have questions for Mike about this? So Mike, I think one threshold question is, do you think that our design review um, process as it stands is um, strong enough to, um, you know, safeguard appearances so that so that so that doing away with the density cap is not an issue what's your opinion on that i mean i 
I know John has pointed out a number of times that, and and I can't say he's he's wrong on it that it hasn't happened and probably isn't going to happen. My issue is when I have to come in and um, and I get uh, put in a position of having to make a staff recommendation based on whether we have enough safeguards in place to make sure it can't happen. And I don't think we have enough safeguards in place to mean that it can't happen. In the design review, I think we're fairly safe. Outside of the design review district, we have a lot of we have a lot of rules. It's not it's not like it's a free wheeling design whatever with somebody's outside of the de, outside of this design review district. We have rules to regulate design, but when push comes to shove and we have um, folks and they've been very vocal um, to come out and make a push that says, you know, do we have safeguards to make sure it can't happen? I don't think our rules are tight enough that we can make it that it can't happen. And when you say it can't happen, the it is uh, a development occurs that the neighbors are unhappy about? Um, they'll usually bring out some extreme cases to go through and say, you know, somebody could come in and do X. Um, you know, they could come in and uh, uh, tear this building down and put in another building in its place that's, you know, and for some re for some reason it's 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 four stories and it has flat roof or three stories and it has a flat roof for some reason some people have a real thing with having flat roofs um but it's a it's a thing that routinely comes up and so in some cases i think we've got a lot of good rules but we don't have strong enough rules that if somebody really wanted to and the truth is most people haven't and the economics aren't there and you know i'm sure john could go and speak to that too the economics just aren't there to go and buy these things and to do those types of deals but if somebody came in with enough money could they really go and and screw up a neighborhood yeah they probably could if they had enough money and really had their mind set on it they probably could but so it probably so let me ask a, wouldn't happen. Let me ask a question at 10-4, because I think what we're talking about, you're going to have those, those people are going to show up and they're going to say the things that they say at all of them, right? On the positive side, let's just say, what, what would we be trying to accomplish? So 10-4, let's look at 10-4. There's a lot of big, beautiful Victorian homes, right? What is it currently now? 6,000? Yep. One unit per 6,000. Okay, I'm sure some of those homes, let's say one of these homes could be converted into efficiencies and you could have eight units or something. Would that be allowable today? Uh, the way it would work today, and I guess maybe that's helpful for everybody to understand how the system works today. I'll just zoom in here. So probably let's go and say where the, my little hand is here. That's probably about a 6,000 square foot lot. Um, yeah. So if they had a 6,000 square foot lot, the most that person could do at their house would be a duplex. They could put, they've got the right to have a single family house because they've got the 6,000 square feet. And because of the rules we have in place, anyone with a single family home, uh, anyone with a parcel big enough for a single family home is also allowed to have a duplex. And I understand the state is actually looking at duplicating our rule and passing it, force, requiring it statewide. Um, so that's what the limit would be right now. They could only have the two units. I mean, um, if we look at conversion of housing, some of these areas inside of the design review, and they could be beautiful. They could be, you know, like all you gotta do is travel, you go to Boston or Newburyport or Portsmouth. They've maintained these homes. They protect the homes. They're, they're gorgeous. Right. But you have multiple people able to live in them and may, and, and therefore make it affordable to maintain and based on the conversation, the, the data, I don't know if you have data or it's anecdotal, Mike, but it sounds like the biggest need is for uh, single individual households, right? That's the biggest housing demand that, we, that we're not meeting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's arguable as to, you know, how many bedrooms, one bedroom, two bedroom. But, you know, as we said, most people right now, 40% of our population are, are people living alone. Um, and 
we don't have that many studios and one bedrooms. And now with people working from home, maybe a single person would want a two bedroom. But again, we're, we're looking at much smaller units compared to the past when, you know, um, you'd have much, much larger families. You know, we had average household size, I think was close to five in the 1950s. And now we're less than two. So, so Mike, did I hear you say that you did feel comfortable saying that um, not having a density cap within the uh, design review district is something you could say is you don't like think that you know development that people are scared about could happen like that you that you were comfortable with that okay. i think we i i think we have enough you know our our design review regulations have been in place since you know we we made changes to them obviously a couple of years ago but um that really was to clarify and to refine them and make them much much better we've had them in place for almost 50 years and i think if we were to look within you know let me zoom back out you know if we were to think about these areas in here this the boundary hasn't changed much in 50 years it's it's a little bit um, you know, 50 years ago, National Life wasn't in it, but we added that in in the 19 late late 70s, early 80s. Um, but for the most part, the, the boundaries stayed pretty consistent. And I don't think we've had development within this box that has been anything that we would go through and say, boy, you know, that that should never have happened. And these areas in here don't have density requirements already. And the sky hasn't fallen. Nothing bad has happened. Um, so I think certainly within the design review district, um, I, I think the only policy thing that would be a drawback from, from our standpoint is when we try to cross that line, we're going to make it harder for us to try to cross that line in the future. Um, I, I don't yeah. know if people follow what I'm saying. Once we've we've pegged it to it's if it's in the design review, then then it, we don't have a density requirement. It might be more difficult to cross that line, but um, what if we? I, I have no idea where we're going to go with this. So so you know uh, this is I'm throwing stuff out there as like guesses, but what if uh, there was a proposal something like no density caps within design review district, maybe it's phased in, maybe it's not, whatever. And also at the same time, increase the density caps by one step for all of the neighborhoods touching. So, so with the idea of by increasing them by one step for the, one, for the neighborhoods that are touching the line, uh, it is looking ahead a little bit to the concern that the line is going to become a like permanent, like. Chinese wall or whatever for for density you know what I mean like like so like so so a different kind of phasing um out instead of like when you hit that design review line it goes from um because some of these neighborhoods you know are like I don't know what red 6,000 or 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 even even requires even more land per unit so it would be it would be a it would be a cliff you know and is what I'm saying is you would go from you can't have much units here at all to your neighbor can have as many units as they want. So instead of having that cliff, maybe we, we phase it out geographically too. I don't know. Or what if, um, what if we just raise that minimum allowable, like, like if we say, you know, four units a lot of anywhere, right? Like there's no, you get away from like focusing on the area and those calculations and it's just like if the, if it's a lot like you can you can put four units there it doesn't matter it's you're in a, you're in a, still bound by the other dimensional requirements and things but um that like simplifies it it gets away from the like you know those small lots where people are are doing this this impossible math of like someone could put 600 you know units here and it's like well that doesn't it's not going to happen but now at least like 
if it's just like four units, it's four units. Anyone can put convert a unit uh, structure to four units. I don't know. Right. And so, and so the four units thing was a that was a different CNU suggestion, right? Um, it was, was for, part of it? it was there was a, a CNU um, recommendation. I think that one was tied to site plan. Oh. Um, the exempting no, site plan up to four. Okay. And so I don't think that four is yeah, I don't think that one's. Albums. I was just gonna say I don't think that one matters quite as much because um, we now do administrative site plans, so we can still do the, the the site plan requirements. It doesn't have to go to a DRB hearing. We do it administratively, and it's not. I, I don't think we need to f do that one necessarily because there's a lot of value in doing the site plan requirements. Um, but because we're doing administratively, it doesn't add any more time or much expense. So I, I like I like the suggestion, John. Um, there is one issue for me that I would really like, and maybe the, this is just me being way too hopeful. One reason why I'd like to see us move away from density is just that it's so unhelpful, period, for no matter where you are. Um, um, because when, when these discussions happen, people fixate on density and, and, and um, to the point of that they're not even getting whatever change is being proposed really because they're just fixing on the density thing um and i don't know i i think that's that's like a factor there is like do we want to come up with something here that that is incrementally moving towards montpelier just not using density anymore or are we just going to look for a solution that's more practical in that we're just going to lighten things up in the ways that we can get away with <laughs> you know what i mean um and i don't i think that's something for us to think about we're running out of time right now so obviously we're not going to be solving anything tonight but i think this was hugely helpful um maybe with that i'll just say that when we take this up again if, if people could keep thinking about it and thinking about what makes sense for a change and and you know mike i'm very conscientious of like what what you're comfortable with and what you feel comfortable um telling city council because i i don't want us to have to come up with something that you're not comfortable with i i really think that this is a possibly big paradigm shift for the city that's really important for housing and planning so i want to make sure that we come as united front so if we can all just think about this, it looks like this was a great place to start. So thank you, Gabe, for suggesting this is a place to start. Yeah, I'll just say too, and I'm sure people have all seen it, but if you pay attention to the discussion that's going on in the legislature, I mean, there's really powerful things, you know, being talked about as it re relates to, you know, equity and social justice and, you know, what, how discriminatory this really is. And so I think, you know, we, we'd all be, you know, paying attention to those discussions and debates. I don't think they're going to go as far as the four plexes. I think that's that's for another day, you know, but maybe we could go that far. But I think, you know, being able to combat um, some of the dialogue that we know will come up in a city council meeting, it's important to to really dial in and pay attention. They're good discussions anyway. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Um, so yeah, that's what we should do before, you know, before we uh, take this up again. Um, I'm not positive that it's going to shake out for the next meeting, but it might, we, we, you know, there's a good chance we'll be talking about this again at the next meeting. So if everybody can spend the next couple of weeks um, thinking about, you know, how we would like to evolve this density question and come with some concrete ideas for us to, to start seriously considering. Um, I think that's gonna be really helpful. And I think I could just leave it at that. Does anybody have anything else? Um, yeah, I might just jump up? in just to go and give a little bit of background. So the Congress for New Urbanism, for, for some of the folks who are new, um, is, you know, it's an organization and, and they, they have a way of uh, doing their zoning where it's it's what are called form-based codes 
and um, and so it really uh, uh, some communities have done it. Winooski is probably the 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 biggest one that's done it where they you, you basically we don't regulate use we just regulate what the buildings look like and fundamentally it's a really good way of doing things it's just a fundamental shift in how you do things and that's um for us to have you know um 80 years of of zoning under our belt and in, in one way and now it would require a fundamental shift in how we do um, our zoning. And so that's kind of where they would want us to go is to kind of get into more design, uh, don't care about the use, you know, uh, set the bulk and the massing and how you want things to look. And it's a very visual, the regulations are very visual. Um, you know, you have to have this, uh, you can't have this. And so it's, it's a different way of doing things and it works very, very well but we don't have those rules and it would take a lot of work for us to kind of develop those rules. So there's a question of, of timing. Do we go forward and adopt a, an adjusted form-based code, which would probably take three or four years to put together, or do we just keep this incremental approach that we're doing and keep loosening the belt uh, and see how things go? Um, and that I think is, is some of the policy questions. And there are people, you know, we've had these public hearings. This is not the first time we proposed to do things. Um, we had proposed to expand the historic design review district. Um, uh, this design review district had been proposed to kind of follow that green, yellow, and then out to the brown line here. So this whole area would have been in the design review district. And, and the opposition was tremendous from ex for the idea of expanding that it would have it's everything that's within the national register district would have been within the design review district and it was really strongly opposed and almost brought down the zoning update so we've been doing this we, we've run into this same group of people over and over again and they're they are they're well organized or they can be at the last second and so that's it's mostly this arguments about it's a political discussion and what people want or don't want. And so, um, you know, that's been the trick of, of getting, getting a hold and figuring out how to make these changes. So, and I will stop sharing. So I know we've got two seconds left. The committee stipends link you guys have, I'll just go and mention that really quick. I didn't wanna have a, a discussion on this. I just wanted to mention that city council had passed a, uh, a resolution or uh, it put money behind a um, project that uh, they wanted to make sure that people, um, this came out of CJAC um, social and, com and, and equity committee, um, folks can't always volunteer to be on committees because they can't afford or they can't afford the child care, or they can't afford to go. So there is a program with stipends. Uh, if you go on the link, it'll tell you all about it. If there's somebody who, even if it's to be um, virtual, if there's a reason why you need some uh, financial assistance to attend the meetings, you're welcome to apply for them. Just let me know and, and we can, I, I, I think I have to file the, the monthly stipend for you because I need to go and sign off that you actually attended the meeting. So if you're in that position and would like to go and participate, look at the, look at the criteria, look at what's in there uh, and get in touch. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Yeah. Glad to get the word out there about that. So check it out if you think you might qualify or, or something you're interested in. Okay, everybody, um, we're out of time. So um, do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Okay. Uh, motion from Gabe. Do we have a second? Second. Second from John. Thanks. Uh, those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.